any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed uh, high atop the Edwards Plateau. And uh, so we got a couple of things to explain here, some updates. Uh, let's see, this is episode 215. Uh, and so next Monday, which would be when we record the next episode, we're going to be out of town. We're going to the Scabland. So it's very possible next week that there won't be a regular podcast episode. But there will be other content showing up on the Discord, on the Twitters, on the Instagram, uh, and other various places, possibly on YouTube. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, we'll be out in the Scablands, and we will be generating content. It just won't be a regular podcast episode because we'll be on the road. And... Uh, yeah, so 216 will come out after we get back from the Scablands. Right? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, I was really wanting to get Randall on for 216. Yeah. So maybe we can record there with him. Yeah. But I don't know if how that happens. Would, yeah, I mean, how you're not going to have here. I won't have any bumper music. and um. <laughs> Right. It would just be a raw recording. <laughs> yeah. I could post it to the feed. Yeah. Yeah, road said. Yeah. I'm not bringing, we're flying and I, we've got all this gear we got to bring. I'm not bringing the, the studio equipment. Yeah, you're so. bringing kid gear instead of studio gear. Yeah, well, I mean, we're also bringing wine and yeah, freaking right. a bunch of radios and, yep. and communication gear and cameras and all, you know. Yeah. So I will have recording equipment, but I won't have a computer to process it. Right. Yeah. I wonder if I could stick that laptop into my bag. I probably could. Yeah. Your laptop. But, you know, if we make a road so it can just be a raw raw yeah. episode. I don't know. Or we could post it to the Patreon, and then when you get back, you can do some editing here. Yeah, yeah, editing. we could do that. Yeah. All right. No more rock and roll updates for now. <laughs> right. Things are still the same. Uh, farm stuff is still the update. same. Yeah. Everything's go, sli- starting to slide towards dormancy, the vines are. <laughs> yeah, and we're uh, just not... Yeah, everything's just slowing down. That's yeah, the update. That's right. That's right. All right, let's go ahead and do our space weather news update then. Because stuff's always happening in space. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Something just knocked out our space weather news jingle. <laughs> Solar wind from the sun's north pole. Earth is inside. A minor stream of solar wind leaking from a far northern hole in the sun's atmosphere. Geomagnetic storms are not expected. Nevertheless, the action of the stream could spark auroras around the Arctic Circle on September 13th and 14th. Uh, So the current conditions, solar wind speed is 487.8 kilometers per second. The density is 5.6 protons per cubic centimeter. Uh, Current sunspot number is 47. Uh, Yeah, that's pretty high. The neutron count is 8.9% above the space age average. And the KP index is 2, which is rated as quiet. And the 24-hour max was 3, which is also quiet. That's the top end of the quiet range. So there you go. That's your space weather news. All right. You got some crypto? Yeah. Crypto update. Um, Bitcoin is at 44,800. Oop, it just went down to 771. (laughs) And Ethereum is $3,252. All right. And I have been watching Cardano, but I bought some and it it dropped. Yeah. So I should probably... I should probably not buy stuff because usually when I buy something, it drops. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's down to $2.43. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Well, it happens. Yeah. It's just, you just got to hold. Yeah, I just, yeah. Yeah, just hold on to it and see what happens. All right, should we tackle some emails? Yeah, let's do it. All right. The first... I, got, I got a good set of stories here that can maybe just wait till the next segment. Okay. 
All right, this one is, uh, it's extremely long. Normally I don't read extremely long ones, but this one's all right, so I'll do it. But this guy says his name is Snake Eyes. Brother Snake Eyes. <laughs> ah, and he says, Snake Eyes nice questions. Player. Yeah. <laughs> Dear Snake Bros, after enjoying every single Cosmographia episode and being left with a gnawing emptiness in my soul while waiting for each new show... The warp and weft of the cosmic fabric seems to have brought me to you. To be honest, I was hesitant at first as I have dedicated my life to smiting Cobra Commander and the forces he has arrayed against knowledge and freedom. And at first glance, I feared your snake force may be a related propaganda front for Cobra Command. <laughs> what is Cobra Command? I don't even know what that is. Is it, is it a G.I. Joe thing? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> well, the watcher probably knows. <laughs> yeah, G.I. Joe. <laughs> so he says, my bad. Imagine my great joy in discovering all you put forth in your relentless subversion of the mind control of Cobra Commander and his agents. <laughs> Pretty sweet. While most of my work is naturally in the shadows, I too have had plenty of engagements with the sinister techniques of skirp derpery that you so often describe and deftly dismember <laughs> from the legions of Cobra Commander's agents in academia, science, and the media. Little known snake fact, they're all part of a pseudo-religion known as the Standard Model, wielding ad hominem and invective like Shimyaza, sweet-talking earth girls into helping him breed little Sam <laughs> <laughs> like all religions, it seems many original ideas and insights may come from actual glimpses of a divine truth, so they do know a lot of real things, but they're often unintentionally twisted via local cultural lenses and then perverted over time by those seeking power who then make those ideas part of the power structure itself, unquestionable and utterly sacrosanct. As you know, many in this anointed priesthood react to evidence and insights running counter to the standard model with the emotional violence of a vengeful zealot hunting heretics, preaching a virulent apostasy. May the fleas of 10,000 camels infest the hairs of their leather elbow patched jackets. <laughs> <laughs> so a big thanks for all you do, including all the back end stuff the Snake Force doesn't have much insight into, like the hours of editing, the research, the tech learning and acquisition, or just being exhausted from your cover jobs and pers persevering after an exhausting day to engage in your real mission in the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science. Sincerely, thank you. Hey, thank you, man. Thanks for the uh, for the kudos there. Yeah, awesome. He says, "I am not, however, writing to kiss your butts." Everyone, oh. everybody knows. Wow, well, fuck off! Then. <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows snakes have no butts, <laughs> which is perhaps why you are immu so immune to a primary skirp derp weapon argument by butt flap. <laughs> Appeals to butt flap have no power here. Such ad hominem has no effect. And my purpose in writing here is actually to seek your insights on a couple of thoughts worth questioning as three snakes are better than one in seeking knowledge and knowing is half the battle. Thought one. In listening to your Velikovsky Heresies series, much connection is made between gods and the planets. And how much of that mythology actually seems to be describing what people actually witnessed planets in our solar system doing? Jupiter slash Zeus swallowing pregnant Metis and baby Venus slash Athena popping out of Zeus's body, all describing a collision between Jupiter and another planet that resulted in the planet Venus and its odd behaviors and properties, etc. There was also discussion of the Anunnaki and how they were believed to be gods, etc. And an add in evidence of knowledge of the interplanetary or interplay of gravity or aspects of electromagnetism related to processional alignments that we still have only caught the slightest whiff of, and how they seem likely to be related to or causing cycles of catastrophe for humanity. All of this caused me to wonder what uh, the key thought here. What if our own idea of the concept of gods has gotten warped over time? What if, after being rocked by a global cataclysmic comet strike that left few people to survive a thousand year nuclear winter only to get hit with another cataclysmic comet strike strike followed by 12,000 years of primitive living our concept and word god devolved into merely the shadows on a cave wall just a fragment poorly understood and misinterpreted of what was a concept far richer or just entirely different to the ancients brother serpents would this not cause us butt flap biases uh cause us butt flap biases so deep and old that we wouldn't even realize we had them so unquestioned so unquestioned and unrealized that it would be the equivalent of not realizing that the word we've been using to describe the color we call blue was what the ancients would have understood as just one of 10 different electromagnetic octaves that were all part of a broader concept they called the blues what if 
Scientifically advanced pre-flood ancients had a different concept entirely of what they meant by gods. And what if it was more of a conceptual catch-all with no supernatural connotations whose meaning was oriented closer to entities outside of us that can control us or events on Earth? Or more directly, what if it originally was an actual science term on par with other common concepts like gravity well or space-time, but for something we only now are barely able to understand as a scientific possibility? What if it was a term perhaps used for an, uh, for an entity that exerted or directed electromagnetic energy in a way that affected or controlled us, as in Earth, or the things and creatures on it? Used in an academic way no different from how we use black holes or star systems with no spiritual or esoteric con connotations at all. If that had been the case, as tech disappeared and science knowledge played millennia-long games of telephone, then the behaviors of gods under that definition could easily get misconstrued towards the supernatural after humanity was bombarded into a 14,000-year stone age, especially if the term was used for a range of things from planetary dynamics in the electromagnetic spectrum to advanced electromagnetic tech used by alien visitors or just our ancient selves. And what of the magic used by gods? So this led me to thought number two. Okay, before we go into thought number two, I think what you're describing is quant suff. Yeah, and we've I I totally agree with that. I I I mean I'm not convinced, but I have definitely asked that question. Like, are these things that called the gods or angels? Are they actually talking about you know uh, physical laws, like you know the laws of physics in some cases, yeah. or uh, even you know with the ancient aliens? hypothesis would it be that that's just a name that they called themselves right, right. like a, yeah. a, you know we call ourselves humans and you can imagine that uh thousands of years from now if there's a completely different species of intelligent being and the humans are all gone that that word could ha end up having similar connotations yeah. right you know what yeah. i mean I, not to say that we're gods or anything it's just the point of yeah, if the if the future beings are primitive and yes. and morphologically dissimilar to us, and they may you know think of human the word human if it even exists anymore, or That's, whatever they call us, will think that will be like God in the sense that they could do supernatural shit just because yeah. they don't understand our technology. Yeah. yeah, it's quant stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yes, I agree with all that. I mean, I would yeah, say the physical laws is a is a really good one. I think. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, they have all these different aspects and they control different powers. Yep. You know, so yep. it, it does, it has, and they can look be to me, they can be like, tricky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And have, you know, uh, unexpected consequences in yeah. some cases when they combine. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess to say directly to thought one there, we agree that's a possibility, but it's, you know, it's, we're, not, we're not fully bought in, but yes, we've talked about this quite often. All right, so going to thought two now. What if the ancients' concept and word for magic was simply, simply related to electromagnetic energy and how it works and how they harnessed it? Just another info category like electricity or chemistry. Yeah, this isn't rocket science Johnson or long brain surgery. It's <laughs> long brain. <laughs> long brain surgery. It's just magic. Now use your Shamir, you butt flapper, and make sure you've got your PPE on. <laughs> If it was originally a science or industrial term, calling something a magic book or a spell book might have been just another equivalent shorthand for something like engineering book or chemistry book, just another tome in a category of science. But the book itself might be titled something like Applied Electromagnetic Energy Dynamics in, li in Litho Construction from Quarry to Temple, or Basic Acoustic Subatomic and Quantum Bonding Between Met Metallic Polymer Alloys and Vimana Propulsion Systems. <laughs> Just another branch of science and tech used to make bigger, cooler, and more powerful stuff. And since this is the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, is there any deep, ancient, etymological connection between the first three letters of magic and magnet? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we talked about uh, electricity, L, like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the suffix at yeah. the end of all the angels' names, L. Yep. That's, that's kind of weird. Yeah, it is. 
So he says, Snake Bros, I think I'll wrap up with this. If basic conceptual and linguistic drift across cataclysms and millennia were at play here in these two concepts, God and magic, our global time as butt flappers, could also mean that we as a species inherited, inherited a primitive butt flappers bias and in basic interpretation of those words in such a total and profound way as to entirely blind us to even the possibility that they mean entirely different and far richer things. Yes, this is, this is the definition of quant stuff. Mm-hmm. Mistaking the shadows for the light and people at the root of them, and like being born with colored lenses on our eyes, never knowing that that filter is even there, and not even knowing we could or should even look for that color, let alone generate the questions leading to the scientific discovery related to it. Yep, you're still, you're you're describing quant stuff in a great way. I mean, the idea that you lose so much of the knowledge behind a concept that you don't even know there's something you've lost. Yeah. Yeah. and you definitely don't have the tools to even begin to retain, regain it because you don't even know you've lost something. That's, and then eventually when you do develop the tools and you find it, you call it something else because you don't realize the correlation. That's right. Yeah. Because that old thing has become something totally, totally different, different, different in your mind. Right. That's right. So he says, when I think of it this way, it seems like Cobra Commander's legion of skirptards are little more than butt flappers in suits laughing at butt flappers and butt flaps pointing at their gods and screaming science while pointing at their science and screaming religion, all while the ancients just smack their heads at both sets of butt flappers, watching them do bo- both do the equivalent of cluelessly grunting and waving their spears at the same concept that neither understands. With the only difference being one side is dressed in the accoutrement of the priesthood. So thanks for all you do and all the brain expansion, snake eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Yeah, real. there's nice long email there. Where you're basically describing the quant stuff. This is a great term. Um, and uh, we've done episodes on it. I think you can find them in the back catalog. There was one where we, we talked all... about it again in, in yeah. the rabbit hole episode. That's right. Recently. We did. Yeah. That's right. All right. Next one here. This is from <clears throat> from Chris. Let's see. Chris is wanting us to watch a video, which I didn't do, but let's see. He says, he says, uh, this is called Watch the Waters Below Lightning and the Earth's Magnetic Disaster on YouTube. He says, okay, so you know the Electric Universe Theory? <laughs> Old jokes a thought aside, watching this video, a thought occurred to me. It has been speculated that the Great Pyramid was a power plant of some sort. If one can draw out rain using electrical stimulation, wouldn't that have been a valuable tool for people living in prehistory Egypt? Living in the hill country, you should know all about wanting rain for crops, and the people of Egypt do also. Technology to bring rain would be worth a massive investment, like the pyramids and possibly other features we don't understand. Just a thought from Chris. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, if it was generating rain. That's that's great. I mean, it's possible. It just depends on when they were built. Yeah. If they were built after Egypt stopped being... Something went wrong with the machine and it flooded the Sphinx enclosure. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, this is from... uh, This one is from Nick the Biological Robot. And I think it's a follow-up to a previous email he sent that we responded to earlier. Uh, Okay, he says, here's another thought and question. The civilizing people who came after the catastrophe and spread knowledge and civilization retaught the survivors how to speak again, etc., etc. How long did they wait before emerging? Was it the same people who witnessed the catastrophe and came out years or decades later, or was it several generations down? However long were they, where were they living while waiting the whole time? And were they in pre-built survival centers, maybe those massive underground cities that have been found or somewhere else are still waiting to be found or in space? The missing history of our planet and our species, singular or plural, drives me nuts. If you've covered this in one of the earlier episodes that I I still have to listen to, forgive me. Love the pictures you posted on Twitter of your recent trip. So jealous. (laughs) Much love from Nick the Biological Robot. And P.S. There is no P.S. this time. Snakes! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know where they were. That's a that's a good question. Uh, you know, the Oannes. I mean, I'll, indications seem to imply that they came out of the sea, but that could just mean that they traveled by boat. I don't know. And it could be that uh, an ancient order 
that uh, carried the knowledge of the location of a library. Yeah. That was to be opened at a certain point in time after the catastrophe. And maybe there were certain, um, and this is all speculation, but the, like there were certain uh, key triggers that were caused them to say, okay, let's yeah. open the library. And so, you know, they go to uh, Serapium and they open the library and they take yeah. all the stuff out and then they go and you learn all that. And then a generation later, they're spreading that knowledge around the yeah around the planet. Yeah, like all that order would have to carry would be a time clock. Like they would just need all that, you know, all they would need to know is the location. The, lo and the location and the positions of the stars at some point. Right, yeah. Um, and and I would say that there is a somewhat of a modern um, example of this, which is the, the Renaissance, right? It's like yeah. there seems to have been like an injection. An injection at that point of ancient knowledge. Like, yeah. you know, uh, I, so I don't know. I, who knows? Yeah. But where were they, I think, is what he was asking. Yeah, my point yeah. is that it doesn't have to be, because the, cause the, the idea seems to be like, well, how did they live for generations? You know, are they, do they have long lives? Yeah. So they can... To be also witness it, but then spread it around. Yeah, generations later, or did they just spread it around like twenty years later? Yeah, yeah, because you're right. He also asked, "How long did they wait?" Yeah, at least at least one or two generations. In some of the stories, it implies that the people had lost even the ability to speak. I think I think that would yeah. take a little while. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what time we got? Don't know the answers. Um, you know the answer to that one? Yeah, I can find that one okay. in 10 minutes. Got time. All right, here's another one that's ask, uh, mentioning a video, but I don't think we have to. <laughs> Watcher says, someone flipped the polarity, <laughs> and it stopped pulling water from the air and instead pulled it from the ground, and boom, desert. <laughs> right. <laughs> in Giza, the, right, the rainmaker. Yeah, the rainmaker. It would require the, a reverse polarity on the, <laughs> on the Earth's magnetic field. <laughs> That's really good. Watch your ass <laughs> that's up. pretty good. That's actually, man. That's 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 really interesting. If if there was some aspect of the Earth's magnetic field that played a part in yeah. the function of the Great Pyramid as a power plant or whatever it did, and then it flips. Yeah, yeah, and it and reverses the, the process. <laughs> Something <laughs> explodes inside the, the king's chamber. And right. Yeah, <laughs> the whole thing stops working. Yeah, and Johnson, you know, was probably you know. So it wasn't. It a was pure... probably designed to handle a reversal, but Johnson dropped that ball and the hook handle <laughs> rod down the shaft, and it just like screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, just enough. <laughs> yeah, dang it, Johnson. <laughs> yeah, and they never knew why. I mean, they wouldn't have known yeah. why until what's his name, you know, <laughs> and then it comes out, and they find out. They're like, "Oh, Jesus, Johnson." <laughs> <laughs> the mystery's been solved. Okay. Uh, this is from Tony. He says, Bowling pin hats. Hey, Snake Bros. Check out this seven-minute introductory video giving an overview of the Magical Egypt seri Season 2 series. The series is a few years old now, but for some reason this article in this article it's embedded in is fairly recent. If you've not already checked out Magical Egypt Season 1 or 2, I highly recommend... Sheds a totally different light onto the wisdom and true genius of the ancient Egyptians and how they melded their expertise in math, science, physiology, and artistry into their temples, architecture, and sculptures. I've listened to a few podcasts where you joke about wondering what the bowling pin hats represent in some of the artwork and on the Ramses megalithic statues, statues at Luxor and how truly strange they are. This series does an excellent job in suggesting, with what is, in my opinion, pretty compelling visual evidence that a lot of the artwork and statues are representations of different views of the brain and its components. The bowling pin in a champagne bucket, according to mainstream explanation, was meant to represent the unification of upper and lower Egypt. The series highlights the more esoteric meaning, i.e. the unification of the upper and lower self, and they emphasize that the side views of these hats indeed align to the profiles of the pineal, pituitary, and thalamus complex of the brain. 
the suggestion being that those adorned with this crown had somehow become enlightened or initiated in some way that involves the ignition of this brain complex. They also look uh, they also look at the Atef crown of Osiris and how it correlates to an axial cross section of the brain, looking at the olfactory nerves, hippocampus, and amygdala. Really compelling stuff, and just thought I'd share. Love the podcast. Keep up the great work from Tony. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, is that even a? It's weird. Like, is that a uh, esoteric meaning? I guess it is in terms of symbolism. Uh, but if they're showing that, like, there are material structures in the brain that are connected to enlightenment. I mean, you know, is this a spiritual explanation or a material one? Yep, I don't know. Looks, yeah. it, I mean, the idea of it showing you stuff about the brain, I, now I'm thinking it's a mortar and pestle and it's like scramble the brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just stir it up a little bit. <laughs> I I the, the I agree. Yeah, and we the, well, how much have we watched a magical Egypt? I can't remember. We need to we need to finish it. Yeah, we never we never completely finished it, but we did watch quite a few of uh, quite a few episodes of it. I don't know about season two, but yeah, it's it's interesting stuff. And of course, it's John Anthony West, you know, so it's uh, the symbolist interpretation. Uh, and I agree that it could be representations of the brain. I I also find it interesting that none of these quote-unquote crowns have ever been actually found so it's like did they exist uh and if they did exist were they actually pieces of technology and that's why they're still hidden i don't know you know i've thought about this quite a bit like were those crowns actual pieces of tech yeah i'm just i i love john anthony west but in in some cases like he he his interpretation of all that stuff is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's mystical. Yeah, yeah. Which is okay, but that's, I kind of, I think more along the lines of like Ben and, you know, Ben from Uncharted X and uh, Christopher Dunn. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm more interested in looking for... Uh, actual machinery or mechanical like you know evidence yes. of of high technology yeah and and west's idea is that they have a high you know spiritual and technolo technological sort of merged yeah science yeah you know so that that's cool i just some of the stuff is just a little bit it's it's too much in the mystical realm for me but uh but yeah we need to finish the the series Kind yeah. of feel bad and that we haven't done it's, that. It's yes, and it's it is more difficult to investigate a mystical yeah exactly interpretation because I mean though I don't know it's like it I guess the it's easier to investigate a mechanical like looking for the tech yeah interpretation and if they're both there then that, then then possibly the tech route is the way to start because we are a technological civilization so the possibility that we can understand the tech bit is higher than the possibility that we can understand the mystical parts and maybe finding and understanding the tech stuff will lead to a pathway to uh decode the mystical so yeah let I me ask this do you have greater understanding of anything you know like the way the universe works or what you know after learning that these hats that they're wearing are symbols for different parts of the brain. Yeah. You know, we know from from a, a lot of modern researchers that the pineal gland has has to do with it's it's uh, associated with the third eye and spirituality and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's like okay, what are we learning, right? Right, yeah. From from these symbols if that's all it is. Yeah. I guess I don't know. Yeah, that's that's not a good argument against it. It's no. just like, OK, I th that's kind of an example of what, you know, what do we do with this information then? Yeah, it, it doesn't seem to further any investigation into the into what's going on. Right. 
to me, but maybe I'm being too critical of it, but I don't know. All right. And the last one here. This is uh, from Roddy the Mammal, who last... What do you mean I lack the prior learning? <laughs> Yes, watcher saying <laughs> to an investigative neurologist, it could be useful. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. Yeah. yeah. But as soon as you tell him you got the information from ancient Egypt, he's going to be like. <laughs> 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 so maybe you just don't tell him that bit. I don't know. All right. This is from uh, Roddy the Mammal, who yeah, last we heard. This would be the last one. Yeah, last we heard from him, he was in the future. Roddy. He says, uh, dear Ophidian siblings. No, the last one was, well, he had another one recently that wasn't the future one. Really? Yeah. Well, the last one I read. Maybe was it was. Okay, I could be wrong. Anyway, so go ahead. Once again, I have been scurrying through time. <laughs> and ever the loyal listener, I have continued to bend an ear to future shows during the rather long time jumps. Yes, I could have purchased a newer time machine, the one with mahogany interior and instantaneous temporal jumps, but the used model was much cheaper and had a better radio. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've stopped my wanderings for the nonce to sit by the fire and pen with electronic quill no less and a few comments and questions to my favorite limbless luminaries. For those keeping score, the fireplace is indeed digital. <laughs> And again, where applicable, I have included an episode number, should the need arise, to facilitate the cross-checking of present comments and questions with previously listened to future episodes. <laughs> One, episode two. Sadly, my question has been redacted due to the show's importance in future events. However, I can't allude to the fact that a question may have been asked, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> what? <laughs> two, episode 1004-A. Now that we've learned the secrets of how and why the pyramids, pyramids were built, will the skirp Skirptars finally stop snickering when we say impossible blocks? And three, due to a spatial instability, question three has been shifted to question six. <laughs> Four, episode 2001. When did we start calling the black monolith we found on the moon that boxy thing? Five, episode 7,213. While it is great that we found a way to revive all those cryogenic heads... I still find it unnerving to see them crab walking about on those little metallic legs. <laughs> six, due to a temporal paradox, question six has been previously asked. <laughs> Seven, episode 871. Who would have thought that the answer was the humble banana? <laughs> and eight, hey. I just think I, I think I just passed Rod Taylor in the time stream. <laughs> Thanks again for an orally entertaining and mentally stimulating podcast. And even though I've just thanked you, I will sign off with my standard closing. Thank you in advance. Endothermically yours, Roddy the Mammal. And P.S. Yes, I do happen to remember the winning lottery numbers. 17, 18, 19, 37, 41, and 53. But unfortunately, I forgot which day these are for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roddy. Thanks, Roddy. Yeah, still can't comment on future episodes, buddy. <laughs> that's uh, hidden knowledge. All right, that's right. All right. Yeah. Well, time we'll, for a break. Uh, Come a back break. for some stories. That's right. Yep. Snakes! back ladies and gentlemen snake bros institute for advanced copper light studies in the tangent cube of science and uh yeah we're going to start this segment with uh, some news stories and i sort of have a, a kind of a theme maybe yeah a little bit i don't know let me get one of these uh, uh so I I one of those beers so can sit back and chill yeah so crack open one of those beers bro don't offer me one, <laughs> asshole. You want one? <laughs> you gotta read. You can't have one yet. Yeah, you're right. Oh, shit. Well. So, uh, okay, this first one is from space.com. Strange repeating radio signal near the center of the Milky Way has scientists stumped. 
It's not a fast radio burst, pulsar, or low-mass star. So what in the heavens is it? Astronomers have detected a strange repeating radio signal, similar to the headline of the story, <laughs> near the center of the Milky Way, and it's unlike any other energy signature ever studied. Wow. Hmm. The rest of the article is blank. Uh-oh. What just happened here? The aliens erased it. Come on. Space.com mobile website mm. always has issues. Mm. According to a new paper accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal and posted on the preprint server archive, the energy source is extremely finicky, appearing bright in the radio spectrum for weeks at a time and then completely vanishing within a day. Hmm. This behavior doesn't quite fit the profile of any known type of celestial body, the, re the researchers wrote in their study and thus may represent a new class of objects being discovered through radio imaging. The radio source, known as ASCAP, was detected with the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, ASCAP, radio telescope, situated in the... Okay, so the... I'm sorry. The source has this ridiculously long number that I skipped, but it's ASCAP, J, ridiculously long right. number. Um, so the telescope is situated in the remote Australian outback, in the ASCAP survey taken between April 2019 and August 2020, the strange signal appeared 13 times, never lasting in the sky for more than a few weeks, the researchers wrote. This radio source is highly variable, appearing and disappearing with no predictable schedule, and doesn't seem to appear in any other radio telescope data prior to the ASCAP survey. Hmm. When the researchers tried to match the energy source with observations from other telescope, other telescopes, including the Chandra X-ray Observatory and the Neil Garrell Swift Observatory, as well as the Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope for Astronomy in Chile, which can pick up near-infrared wavelengths, the signal disappeared entirely, with no apparent emissions in any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum. ASCAP, J, ridiculously long number, is a radio ghost that seems to defy explanation. Hmm. Prior surveys have detected low-mass stars that periodically flare up with radio energy, but those flaring stars typically have X-ray counterparts, the researchers wrote. That makes a stellar source unlikely here. Dead stars like pulsars and magnetars, which are two types of ultra-dense collapsed stars, are also unlikely explanations. While pulsars can stream bright beams of radio light past Earth, they spin with predictable periodicity usually sweeping their lights past our telescopes on a time scale of hours, not weeks. Magnetars, meanwhile, always include a powerful X-ray counterpart with each of their outbursts. Again, unlike ASCAP J ridiculously long numbers behavior. <laughs> the closest match is a mysterious class of object known as a galactic center radio transient, or GCRT, which is a rapidly glowing radio source that brightens and decays near the Milky Way's center, usually over the course of a few hours. So far, only three GCRTs have been confirmed, and all of them appear and disappear much more quickly than this new ASCAP object does. However, a few known GCRTs do shine with a similar brightness as the mysterious signal, and their radio flare-ups are never accompanied by X-rays. If this new radio object is a GCRT, its properties pushed the boundaries of what astronomers thought GCRTs were capable of. Future radio surveys of the galactic center should help clear up the mystery. Hmm. I don't know. I, I just, when I read this story, it just reminded me of, you know, shouting in the dark. Yeah, that's what I thought too. But it's, there's, no, it's not a there's stellar no star origin. there, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it could be shouting in the dark from a big spaceship. Yeah, and it's coming from the galactic center. I mean, right. maybe they're using, you know, it's like, this would be one way of doing a type of decoy. Yep. They can't destroy the whole galaxy. Right. So send the signal from the center of the galaxy. Yeah. Anyway, really cool. Yeah. Next story. And if you're wondering what we're talking about with Shouting in the Dark, we just did a Patreon episode about the Dark Forest Hypothesis, so you can check that out. 
<laughs> yeah, that's what Watcher said. Some alien civilization is, is shouting numbers. In <laughs> yeah, he telescope. says they're shouting random numbers. <laughs> just to me, you know, the asshole, you start, you're trying to count and some asshole comes along and starts spouting <laughs> off random numbers. Okay, astronomers, uh, so this, this um, was written by unexplainedmysteries.com. Astronomers have obtained their first detailed look at a peculiar Milky Way object known as the accident. Originally detected using NASA's Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or NEOWISE, telescope, this object is not quite a star, yet not quite a planet either. It fits into a class of objects known as brown dwarfs, or yeah. failed stars, a type of star that can be up to 80 times the diameter of Jupiter, yet with a mass significantly lower than that of our sun. Brown dwarfs are thought to start off their life as a regular star, but their mass prevents them from being able to sustain nuclear fusion, causing them to dim and fade away over billions of years. This particular example, however, is quite unusual even for a brown dwarf. Known as the accident, because it was discovered photobombing a group of other candidates, the <laughs> object appears to possess characteristics consistent with both young and old brown dwarf stars. Hmm. The object defied all our expectations, said lead study author Davy Kirkpatrick. A further study of the object revealed that it is moving much faster than the typical brown dwarf, suggesting that it may have been flung around the galaxy for billions of years. Its atmosphere is also strangely devoid of methane, indicating that it could be twice as old as the other brown dwarf stars that astronomers have studied. It's not a surprise to find a brown dwarf this old, but it is a surprise to find one in our backyard, says study co-author Federico Mar uh, Marocco. We expected that brown dwarfs this old exist, but we also expected them to be incredibly rare. Hmm. The chance of finding one so close to the solar system could be a lucky coincidence, or it tells us that they're more common than we thought. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you go with the Copernican idea, it should imply that they're more common than we thought. Yeah. Giant, slightly warm object. <laughs> hauling ass. <laughs> Pretty nearby us. Yeah. Okay, next one. This is cool. Earth Mystery News. Uh, let's see if they repeat the... Uh, no, they don't repeat the headline. Viruses may exist elsewhere in the universe, warns scientist. <laughs> 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 Professor Paul Davies suggests viruses may form vi a vital part of the ecosystem on other planets. A leading scientist has warned that viruses may not only be found on Earth, but might occur should life exist elsewhere in the universe. Professor Paul Davies, an astrobiologist, cosmologist, and director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University, said that the idea of aliens ranges from microbial life to super-advanced civilizations that might be signaling to us. But Davies backed the idea that a wide range of microbes and other microscopic agents would probably be needed to support life as a whole, whatever form it takes. And it seems viruses, or something that performs a similar role, could be part of the equation. Viruses actually form the uh, part of the web of life, said, said Davies. I would expect that if you've got microbial life on another planet, you've bound to have... You're bound to have, if it's going to be sustainable and sustained, a full complexity and robustness that will go with being able to exchange genetic information. Mm. Viruses, said Davies, can be thought of as mobile genetic elements. Indeed, a number of studies have suggested genetic material from viruses has been incorporated into the genomes of humans and other animals by a process known as horizontal gene transfer. A friend of mine thinks most, but certainly a significant fraction of the human genome is actually of viral origin, said Davies, whose new book, What's Eating the Universe, hmm. was published last week. According to Davies, while the importance of microbes to life is well known, the role of viruses is less widely appreciated. But he said if there is a cellular if there is cellular life on other worlds, viruses or something similar would probably exist to transfer genetic information between them. What's more, he said it's unlikely alien life would be homogenous. I don't think it's a matter that you go to some other planet and there will be there will just be you This is written really strange. There will just be one type of microbe and it's perfectly happy. I think it's got to be a whole ecosystem. Hmm. 
While the thought of extraterrestrial viruses may seem alarming, Davies suggests there is no need for humans to panic. <laughs> <laughs> Don't panic. <laughs> the dangerous viruses are those that are very close, closely adapted to their hosts, he said. If there is a truly alien virus, then chances are it wouldn't be remotely dangerous to humans. Davies comments because right, it just turns you into an alien. Yeah, and then you're no longer a human, That's so right. it's not dangerous to you. <laughs> Davies comments come after a study published in late August suggested that our that signs of life may be detected beyond our solar system within two to three years, but the need to consider entire ecosystems does not only apply when considering alien life. Wow, this he is says written very strangely. He says signs of life will be detected within two to three years. That's yeah, really isn't cool. that weird? Wow. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Maybe he already knows something. <clears throat> yeah. Let's see. Davies, whose conversation is peppered with nods to former colleagues and associates from Stephen Hawking to Fred Hoyle, the great, if unconventional, former director of the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge University, said it is also important should humans attempt to colonize another planet. Most people think about, well, we would need to have very large spacecraft and then sort of recycle things for the very long journey and then all the technology you would need to take. He said, actually, the toughest part of this problem is that you would need the microbiology that you'd have to take. It's no good just taking a few pigs and potatoes and things like that and hoping when you get to the other end, it'll be a wonderful and self-sustainable situation. Among other positive roles, viruses that can infect bacteria known as phages can help keep bacterial populations in check, while viruses have also been linked to a host of other important processes from helping plants survive in extremely hot soils to influencing biogeochemical cycles. And as Davies notes, a significant fraction of the human genome may be remnants of ancient viruses. Hmm. So, yeah. I wonder if he, uh, he mentions Fred Hoyle, but not... Chandra Wickramasinghe. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Mysterious objects out in space <laughs> and viruses from outer space. What's the, what's the, what was the reason they were saying that that brown dwarf looked both old and young? I didn't catch that exactly. I, I did catch that. Yeah, the, I, d I know. Uh, what was the part that made it look young? Oh, that it was close to us, or something, or that oh, the, the okay. fact that we saw it, okay, right? I think is is the indication, right? Because old ones are really rare, so you would expect there would be there to be young ones around us, yeah, but no old ones. But this one was going so fast, and fast relative to what us or mm. don't know. Is it moving in a strange way for it to be orbiting the center of the galaxy? Does it imply that it was like extra galactic? Yeah, galaxy, because it's suggesting, the speed suggested that it may have been flung around the galaxy for billions of years, mm. and the atmosphere is devoid of methane, so it's, it's okay, like... Okay, so that's another indication of it being old. Yeah, and so he's saying it's it's not a surprise to find a brown dwarf this old, but it is a surprise to find one in our backyard. Right, okay. Backyard meaning... We oh. expect that brown dwarfs this old exist, but we also expected them to be incredibly rare, so yeah. it's the chance of finding one so close to the solar system, he's saying, could be a lucky coincidence, or it tells us that they're more common. Right. Okay. Because they're thinking that the old ones are incredibly rare. Right. Hmm. And then, yeah, going back to that <clears throat> weird radio burst with the incredibly long numerical name, uh, you see how this happens. And this kind of goes back to our discussion in the Patreon episode of the Dark Forest, but there is like a bias towards treating any phenomena that you see out in space as natural. Natural, you know. Uh, and I mean, is that a is this a good thing to do? Like, in other words, it's, I've heard these... it seems to be uh, uh, based on it's it's like with Avi Loeb, right? Talking about the uh, Amuamua yeah. object, like listening to some of the interviews with him, it's like the the or or people that were arguing against his his hypothesis, mm -hmm. they're critical of him for even bringing that up, right? Because first you have to spend all this effort to prove that it's to Not, rule out the possibility that it's natural, right? Which is basically impossible, isn't it? I mean. 
This is kind of the thing we were talking about, too. Like, we sort of covered this. Like, I don't see why large technological events taking place out in the universe that, that are stimulated by an incredibly advanced race wouldn't look like natural occurrences from far away. Yeah, but I think there's sort of a culture built up around that. That there's like an accepted yeah, there's like methodology an yeah for dealing with weird stuff from outer space because there was a lot of hype and you know yeah during mistakes those, were made and people were embarrassed yeah, yeah 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 right so so there's this inertia built up where no matter how strange it is when you see it out there in space the assumption is going to be made like okay this was a natural occurrence even if Right now, we can't explain how it was natural. We're going to assume it's natural and try to find an explanation that fits within our current model of how the universe works to explain it as a natural occurrence. And you see the same thing with the UFO phenomena. Yeah. Right. There was, it, it was like the same deal. Lots of hype, and then the news stories went flying, all went viral, and people got all worked up, and then somebody was like, well, crap, it was a weather balloon. <laughs> yeah. You know? And yeah. So there's like this... <clears throat> There's this tendency to not make that mistake. Otherwise, they'll get ridiculed or something. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we just had a huge break. Yeah, and I just just smoothly, smoothly uh, finished the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we sewed that up perfectly. <laughs> All right, we've been not recording for two hours. <laughs> so. And at which way did you turn that timer? I turned it. Yes. Okay. I remember. All right. I did. Yeah. We had an invasion into the cube. And That's then, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then we had to handle family. And there was lots of soccer. Family stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what's next? Well, uh, if we're done talking about the news stories, I guess we can go, uh, we can talk about the, some of the discussing the topics we wanted to talk about before. But first, we do have a one-up box that we should open here. Yeah, which is also something that showed up just now. Right. I mean, it's been here for a long time. Right. And Laura has been telling us, you need to take that in there. But <laughs> um, I thought it was her job to bring it in here. I don't right. know. Right, yeah. She finally brought it to There's us. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Okay, Snake Brand Prickly Heat Original Cooling Powder. Hmm. Snake brand prickly heat cooling powder. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> There's a whole Let's bunch see. of stuff in here. This is soothing powder, which is effective in relieving itching, prickly heat rash, and skin irritation from hot weather. Hey, look huh. at this. Surveying for archaeologists. Oh, that's cool. Old book. Yeah. University of Durham. Wow. Hey, this maybe this will teach us how to properly dig. Yeah. And this one says it's archaeological inventory. I'm trying to translate. It's not in English. It's in Spanish. Interesting. Very old book. Yeah, this is this is cool. It's Indian me. doctor nature, nature's method of curing and preventing disease according to the Indians. <clears throat> this is all from Wish. Too, yes, by the that's way. right. Well, I'm looking for the note. This says, oh. for, I'll get, I'll get to that. There's got to be. A, I think there's a note in here. Here it is. Okay, here. Oh. All right. So the note says, "Hello, woohoo, what up?" So <laughs> I've been collecting stuff since my last parcel. I had really meant to have it uh, with you all ready for the 201st surprise episode, but you know, lots of snaky obstacles. Okay, there's a leather bracelet for Laura. Yeah, that's cool. It's from the Viking Museum in York. And goodies for soul. <laughs> is that what that is? All the snakes and cows and stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah. Goodies for soul. Yeah, these are cool. Random books that I figured would be more useful to you lot. Uh, you lot. Should I read this in <laughs> English? Random books that I figured would be far more useful to you lot. <laughs> a t-shirt from my local tobacconists that you bros can fight over. However, the label in the garment might... Settle any quarrels. Black Swan Wakefield. That's cool. <laughs> What's That's the a nice label? Shirt. Let's see the label. What is it? How is it going to settle oh. quarrels? Oh, Russell. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's totally mine. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> a piece of pottery I've collected from my small holding, and the rest, they're self explanatory. Enjoy the serpent booty. Slither and go safely, you guys. Love, Shannon. 
That's cool. This is like this Egyptian postcard from way back. Oh That's yeah. Awesome. Look at that. All right, let's see what this is. This one says specifically for Russ. Um, understanding sacrifice. It's a beautiful piece of art. I guess this is the pottery. This is the bowl here. Look at that. That's really the apis. Cool. Oh yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. It looks like uh, some uh, asterisms or whatever. Yeah. Constellations. Constellations. Space. The moon. Very cool. Thank you. Some of these will have to go in the the books. Will have to go in the snake library for sure. Awesome. I'm sure Soul's gonna love all those little toys. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah, and sorry it took us so long to uh, get it in here. Right. Yeah. Sometimes when you know when when we start recording and Laura's not here, we just don't know we have a lab yeah. box. Yeah. <laughs> and then she'll tell me when we're not recording, and right. I'm like, oh, okay, when we're cool. already done. Yeah. And then uh, recording day comes around and she's not here. I don't remember. Yeah. So yeah, it's the way things go around here. It sorry is, about yeah. that. Very structured and, and <laughs> planned out and <laughs> professional. That's right. <laughs> okay, so we got half a segment left after abruptly interrupting ourselves and kind of forgetting what we were talking about. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> space is weird. <laughs> um, and okay, so I guess for the main topic, we were just going to have a. Uh, sort of free for all discussion, but I had I had some things I wanted to to touch on regarding um, the things we've learned in the last few episodes with Marty, mm -hmm. and I think you could say I'm going full skirptard on all this. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is one angle. Like I'm not married to these ideas, right? But um, so I wanted to start out with uh. With an anecdote, which is years ago, Russ and I were working at a call center oh, yeah. for a cell phone company, right? We were the receiving, like we were the tech support yeah. call center. We, we were working at this place and we had to go through a training course uh, for, I think it was like a week long or maybe mm -hmm. two weeks. I can't remember. Class every day for a week, basically. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, the system that we had to learn how to use, the computer system that we learned how to use was, you know, had a couple of things that would help us deal with actual hardware or, you know, some kind of connectivity problems with people. And it was the way they described it in the training was this is 90 percent of what the problems this will solve 90 percent of the problems, problems yeah. that people are calling about. Right. Yeah. And it was just a button that we pushed or clicked on. Yeah. In the computer system. And it was, the button was refresh signal. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so one of the other parts of the training was obviously things you're not supposed to do when talking to customers. And uh, the teacher, the instructor gave an example of somebody who got fired from the company for messing with customers. And, you know, they had, the story was some old guy calls up. My phone ain't working right here. <laughs> and the, you know, the, the the guy working at the call center was like, okay, man, listen, you know, after he describes what the problem is, the guy immediately knows I just need to refresh the signal. Yeah. But instead of doing that, he tells the customer, like, do you have a potato? <laughs> oh, yeah, I got a potato. <laughs> All right, go go get a potato and then get some tinfoil. Trust me, man. This is this is it's going to work. Just believe, just So the guy goes, he gets a potato. Okay, wrap the potato in tin foil. He wraps the potato in tin foil. Are you sure? This is yes, dude, you got to trust me. This is it's this is probably going to solve your problem. <laughs> so go go to your television before flat screens. Yeah. And put the potato with the tin foil wrapped around it on top of the television and you you need to turn it to like channel 15 or whatever, you know. And then just spin the potato. And so the guy goes to do it, and he spins the potato, and the guy at the call center hits the refresh button. Yeah. And he's like, all right, check your phone. And so the guy checks his cell phone. Oh, my God, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like it's working. 
Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if we were in the but class, we were like, this it. is an awesome prank. <laughs> but yeah, the guy got fired because yeah. they're monitoring the calls and all that. Yeah. So, but that's that's not really important. The the point is that there's this really there there's this actually really complicated technology involved. And even the guy at the call center doesn't know how it works, but he has a button. Yeah. In other words, how to make it work is a really simple thing, even though maybe the technology is really complex. Yeah. I like driving a car. It's full of complicated mechanical stuff that most people you have don't need zero clue at, but yeah. you just push the pedal and turn the wheel. Yeah. 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 So he basically, because most people don't know how all of this stuff works, he's able to to get by with this crazy scheme that he has and makes the guy think that spinning a potato wrapped in tinfoil on top of the television on channel 14 is going to fix his cell phone signal. Yeah. And so I've been thinking of like, I'm using that as an analogy to a possibility and when it comes. Before you go any farther, okay. I all, in that class, I always wanted to ask, but what if that is what fixes? <laughs> how the does problem? the guy know? How do you? How does? Yeah. How do the the higher ups know that spinning the potato is is not actually what fixed the problem? Yeah. So, and that's that's a good question for this analogy. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's right. That's why I wanted to preface it there because it's, it's funny. Most likely no. Right. But most likely not. But there is this chance. <laughs> Because spinning aluminum wrapped around a starch <laughs> might just... That's right. In know. the vicinity of another receiver <laughs> that is also operating in the same band. <laughs> so the analogy is to these occult practices. And to me, these things look like quant stuff or something of the like. Or, for example... There is a technology or there was a technology that was at work long ago and maybe some people were in control of the technology and others weren't. Like, you know, a good example would be, you say, the Ark of the Covenant, right? They're carrying this thing around and it, they take it out at war and, and it just like is just destroying enemies and all that kind of stuff. But instead of giving the people... A real weapon. They're like, listen, you need to build this box, right? It's got to be acacia wood. Yep. And then you need to wrap it with a specific cloth. And then, yeah. you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. They tell them all this stuff. It's it's almost the same with the shamir, right? Yeah, well, it's got to be, you got to put it in some wheat. Yep. So they're telling you, they're telling the people this complicated process to build some device that doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. While when they go out to use it, the people with the actual technology are there pushing the button yeah. that makes stuff the happen. events happen. That the people think, oh my gosh, this device is incredible. And then, of course, when the people with the actual technology are not there, it doesn't work. Somebody steals the Ark of the Covenant or whatever yeah. and they try to go use it. It doesn't do anything and they all get their asses kicked. Right. So, you know, taking that analogy again back to the occult practices, that's what this looks like to me. You know, you're going to you're going to draw you got to have these specific paints and you're going to paint this geometric design. The geometric design has to be very specific and you have to chant these really specific words and it has to be under this particular moon or arrangement of planets and all this. You know, it's just yeah. all these ridiculous details. And the possibility is it doesn't do anything but make the people but. Like if there's somebody with an actual technology that is able to do stuff, if they're there, they're making the people think that they're doing something. Yeah. Right. And and I don't know. I just that shows up in. It's interesting because I'm now I'm thinking that shows up in the Wheel of Time series as well, and it's the same exact scenario you're describing. Somebody from the deep past who is an advanced person, like that, their civilization has collapsed from an advanced society. So somebody from the past who knows all the tech and the magic from the past tricks a whole bunch of people by giving them these things that he calls them. I can't remember if they were call boxes or teleport boxes or something, but he's actually the one making the teleportation work. He's doing it with his understanding of yeah. how the, the magic works. And then they all go and they think it's the box that's making them be teleported. 
And so later on, they're all pushing the box, trying to escape from the situation they're yeah. in. And of course, he's not there, so it doesn't work. This and is like happens. a classic intelligence operation, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You make them think that they have this awesome tool, and it works as long as you're watching over it and making sure that yeah, right. you're there when the things that you want to happen are happening. And then when later you dump those people and you don't need them anymore, they don't have any technology. Right. Yeah. And so I just, I don't know, looking at these occult practices and stuff and just, you know, I, I did go back and listen to the book, uh, the the Charles Manson book. And I'm just like, you know, this guy. Chaos. Yeah, chaos. Called chaos, yeah. I'm just like, this guy was just, he was just, he was a psychopath. Yeah. And he figured out how to mess with people's minds by getting them on, on drugs that do mess with your mind. Yeah. Right? It's not. To me, that's not far fetched. That he was possibly a a tool of the of of the CIA or whatever. I don't know, but the idea that that they're actually using some weird chanting and occult practices to channel the power of interdimensional beings. Yeah, like I, I'm just not buying that. That's just I'm just like no. The guy's just a psychopath and he's power hungry. Yeah. And so you can you can kind of make the case that like these guys that are going out trying to do the Babylon working and bring about the Antichrist and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Doing all this work. It's like, okay, is that the reason? Like because they were engaged in all these weird practices, is that why they became powerful? Or did they become powerful because they were power hungry people? Yeah. And they were willing to do to go to any lengths including bring about the Antichrist <laughs> to get power. You know, a lot of times those people are going to succeed in becoming powerful over some people. Yeah. Regardless as to whether or not they're drawing geometric designs in the ground and chanting stuff and hoping to get demons. I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm really skeptical about that type of stuff. That, that isn't to say that I don't, that I discount the possibility of the existence of powerful beings that can communicate telepathically or, or, you know, whatever, a spiritual realm with powerful beings in it. And part of the other, like another direction that I've been looking at this is, is one that I brought up during the show, which is this sort of paradoxical situation that is, and, and I'm not sure if Marty if 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 this is like built into his the model he's sort of developing that was you know it was the analogy at the beginning right that a that an alien race could develop technology that gave them access to basically what is the spirit realm and they're able to project yeah themselves and consciousness and maybe even drones and all that kind of stuff across the universe over here and and the 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 paradox there to me, or maybe it's not a paradox, maybe that's not the right uh, description, but if there is, if that spirit realm or whatever we're calling it is, does exist and consciousness does stem from there, then it would make sense that there would be other intelligent beings there yeah, that are not here, right? So th there would be something you would encounter if you developed a technology to utilize that dimension or whatever you would call it. So if an alien uh, race developed some technology to do that, who did they run into when they, when they yeah. accessed it, right? And so it seems to overcomplicate the situation to say that perhaps this is an alien race that gained access to a spiritual realm and then use some kind of technology to then project themselves and stuff here when it's like, well, if you're already assuming the existence of that spiritual realm, then why can't it just be the spirits over there? Yeah. Doing it. Yep. So it's like, you know, I don't know. It's like there's. And yeah, in some ways that analogy seemed to. We kind of talked about this on, well, I keep bringing up the Patreon episode. So like the, the idea of, this thing, the spirit realm, you know, this is a term that is loaded with connotations. And so it's like, is it really just part of the universe? And yeah, it, of course. it can be accessed with technology and it's not really spirit like we think of it. 
Yeah. You know. I mean, if it exists, then we are considering it like that's just part of the universe, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, the the uh, the segment's over. So, we can get back to this, back into this on the next segment. But, yeah, I want to I want to continue on this, this idea on the next segment. So, we'll do that. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, second hour. And we are discussing uh, the possibility that some of these complicated occult rituals may be not necessarily exactly quant stuff, but a kind of part of the trickster phenomenon, which I think is a really interesting idea. I do agree that, that, I mean, it seems to me like, so Kyle and I have had this conversation several times outside the show preparing to talk about this on this on this episode and uh it's it seems like what you're talking about may be part of the trickster phenomena right there it could be yeah yeah it's like this is the point it's it's or that it's very ancient right these things come from very ancient sources yeah so if there was an advanced civilization dealing with less advanced people they could have yeah. Been using what looked like magic again, but it was just technology and sort of, you know, manipulating people with it and yeah. kind of teaching them stuff that didn't really actually do anything. Yeah, right. And I was thinking of, you know, like that the you're talking about, you know, you just draw these shapes on the ground or whatever. And like, you've got to get the shapes exactly right. Or you're writing this script out. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking of like, this isn't an exactly perfect analogy, but the but somebody who sees circuitry and doesn't know what it is, but then thinks that it's all those geometric lines yeah. that are required to make, you know, the, the Google thing happen or something. Yeah. The other, the other possibility I thought of was that this is a, an actual quant stuff of not a technology, but of hallucinogenics, like yeah. a tradition of doing hallucinogens, Right. And the idea that you that you see all these geometric shapes, and maybe there's like a chanting, but which is could be just you know, yeah. this all has to do with the trip. And then of course you meet some, you summon some demon or some god or some angel or whatever, yeah, in that process, and it gives you some power. But the power, all of this stuff is like within yourself. It, it's not a it's not any kind of external power that you can wield. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so going back to the, to what I was talking about right before the, the end of the break there, or right into the break there is, is the idea that if the spirit realm is part of the universe, is it accessible through advanced tech? Yes. Okay. Right. Right. And that's, that's, that's really a question that, there, I, I have no answer for it, but it is a question that's good to ask because I think it seemed to me when we were going through Marty's material that in some ways he was implying, yes, it is ad- accessible through advanced tech or maybe a better way to say it is it's just advanced tech of some kind and it's been mistaken by the past 12,000 years of humans right, which, yes, as that's... something supernatural when it's not. It's it's part of the universe, right? Yeah. And then Kyle and I have this argument. Well, like, well, you know, is anything actually supernatural? Like, what is supernatural? That's just, you know, we came to the idea that the term itself, supernatural, is really a skirptard word, because what they want to do is take certain phenomena and just set them outside of the possibility entirely, calling them supernatural. But what we're saying is, it no matter what it looks like, if it takes place, if it really happens then it's natural. It's part of the universe. Yeah, right? unless it's just false. Yeah, right. So the terms are weird. So we say things like spiritual or supernatural, and what we mean are the things that people have called that for a long time. Yes. But if you take into account that, let, let's say that, well, lots of those things are real, then they aren't supernatural. They are natural, yeah. They're natural, okay? 
So there's that. There's that, that problem. And that, yeah, that gets tricky. And this is yeah. this is one of the reasons why we develop terms of our own to to kind of like okay, yeah, that idea. Yeah. Because you don't want to have to go through the whole rigmarole again. Right. <laughs> right. So. But again, uh, in some cases, like when we use the geological eras, like, you know, in, when we were going through um, uh, Hidden History of the Human Race, they used the geological eras because it's 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 a simple way. And everyone understand not everyone understands them, but like, you know, everybody but can the look them up. the lexicon has been. Yeah, it's been. You know, yeah. So you say Cretaceous and everybody knows and, yeah. what you're talking about and like, ex or, you know, that it's this. You can look it up and say, oh, OK, that's supposed to be from this time to this time. But it's it's a given Due to the nature of the conversation, the, the dates might be wrong and yeah, a whole yeah, bunch yeah. of other stuff might be wrong, right? So we use terms like supernatural and spiritual with this in the same sense. So one possibility is that things we call supernatural realm or the spiritual realm or whatever are actually just ac are just very high technology. Going back to that quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, right? And it's possible that we have pieces like like in marty's one of marty's intro analogies he was saying what if there's a like a, a, a an internet of space that uses some fundamental part of space like dark matter or whatever you know electromagnetic spectrum something that is spread out across space and it's, it basically can function as a storage device and a computational device uh in in the macro universe and act as a cloud, right? And so eventually some species might get to the point where it just uploads its consciousness into this cloud and it becomes an all, you know, a functionally present everywhere, intelligent being that has no material, you know, no mm -hmm. material body or whatever. Like you're uploaded to the cloud, but the internet of the cloud is all throughout space. Yeah. That was one of the things he was making. So to, so on when you look at that analogy he's making, it looks like a, this is all technology kind of explanation mm -hmm. for sp spirit realm. And, you know, so maybe these entities that are speaking to people in these stories or whatever are actually just part of this high technology. Yeah. And I think that he's calling those analogies because he's not saying like, that it's exactly this what's theory happening. is like, this is yeah. just one way to imagine like, is yeah. this possible? Right. right? Like that, that con there could be consciousnesses, but given given the the concept that if it does exist or it does take place, then it's natural and part of the universe. Does that mean that things that people have for a long time called spiritual or supernatural mean that they are eventually accessible through technology? This is a question that I've been asking myself because like this is to me, this seems like a dividing line here. You know, it's it's if we're going to say, well, really, this is all going back to the basically the ancient alien hypothesis. And we can say that all these interactions with that humans have been having over the past thousands of years are really with just ex extremely advanced physical beings in the universe. Whether they're right. still physical or not in the sense that they have bodies doesn't matter. In other words, what we're saying is, is these are these are entities that have attained some kind of technological state that we can't even barely comprehend. And so they appear to be what supernatural or spiritual. Yeah. There's that. Or on the other hand, you can say, well, no, there is a spiritual realm. Like what we've talked about with Laird Scranton and, you know, other researchers like that have said that there is this other realm. It is in some ways connected to, and can interact with our universe in a limited way. That's different from, all of that stuff being extremely high technology that's indistinguishable from magic, I think. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is in the second one where there's actually a spirit realm, it's not, it's not discarnate entities in the physical realm using high technology, but there's this other realm. Is that one discoverable through mechanistic study of the universe? And is it accessible by technology? And if not, what does that mean for these kinds of, you know, so that's what I'm saying is to me, it's a complex question because you've brought up this idea like, well, these rituals seem to be weird or they, they seem to be like a troll on the part of the, the uh, you know, it's like the spinning the potato thing. It's a, it, the ritual itself doesn't work. It's whether or not the entity is paying attention to the person doing it. Yeah. That, that, or at least the, the amount In of other words, the, ritual, the results you get are whether or not the entity is paying attention. The but, ritual was, was a design. Yeah. 
by the entity to trick the user. Yeah. Not the other way around. It wasn't a design by the user to 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 summon, summon forth the, the entity. entity. Yeah. Yeah. And so if the entity isn't using you currently, you're not going to think any of that stuff works. Right. And if you end up doing it, you are going to think it works because they want you to think that that works. Right. Yes. It's a psyop, like a trickster yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And again, I'll bring up Christopher Knowles from the Secret <clears throat> Sun, Secret Sun website, Secret Sun blog or whatever. Uh, and he said the same thing. He's like, look, you know, if you do believe all this stuff, he's like, just don't mess with it. If you believe all this stuff is real, what do you have to offer these all powerful you know, if you think this entity can come and it has the power to give you all this power, well, what do you have to offer it in return? Yeah. You know, and some people are like, well, your soul. Well, what is that? I mean, how is that really, you know, that also could be part of the trick. The entity's like, sure, I want your soul. You know, what does that even mean? It's it's answering a question with a mystery. That's another thing. If you if you if you are gonna go the traditional route, the idea that somehow and I, I feel like this is a, you know, this is a, I, I don't know how many different religions may may think this way or, or this may be part of their traditions, but it's definitely Christian where it's like the human soul is like the most highly prized right. thing. Yeah. Right. So there's like this war going it's, on over the human yeah. soul. It's like the spirit realm Bitcoin or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like. <laughs> Everybody wants it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't make sense to put a nuts and bolts, you know, sort of ancient alien civilization gaining access to the spirit realm that's already full of beings trying to get human souls. Yeah. Like what did they have to offer, right? right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just like I'm I'm I, did I don't they know. sell all their souls to get access to the spirit realm? So are they come here and worth anything? <laughs> they, so they can come here and harvest our souls? I mean, like, what is happening? I just, yeah. So it just, to me, and like I said, I may be being a total scurb tar, but this just doesn't add up. And I'm kind of like, okay, the occult practices, I think, are just bunk. Yeah. I just, I, I don't know. I th Or I think a really good possibility is that they are quant stuff, like, you know, people tripping. Yeah. Hallucinogens. It could be that. I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's possible that hallucinogens are a lost tech, uh, you know? Yeah. If, if there was a previous civilization, a very advanced, now collapsed, almost completely erased civilization that was good at bioengineering, maybe most of the hallucinogenic plants we have around are products of their efforts in either case i think it's less complicated to have both separate so if you have an intelligent conscious alien being then and also a spirit realm then their consciousnesses are part of that spirit realm as well yeah so there's already the connection there but they would build tech that was able to, you know, it could be amazing tech and they're able to come here in nuts and bolts craft. And that could be a phenomenon. Yeah. Then there's also these encounters that are spiritual in nature. And they're not the same. Yeah. But that maybe, you know, some of the things that cause people to have spiritual enlightenment are the things that just completely... Uh, change their entire way of thinking or their paradigm or shock them out of the, of, you know, what they thought was reality. Yeah. And so a lot, in a lot of cases, very uh, powerful physical experiences are, they, they have a spiritual effect. Yeah. That's right. On people. I mean, even, even a landscape can do this to you in the right conditions. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I think I, I just I feel like it's a it's sort of a too complicated to try to merge these things together. Yeah, I well, I so I go back to Valet who says that we have to face the fact that they seemed to be 
the, well, he doesn't say that the spiritual and the nuts and bolts stuff seem to be together. He just says that it's undeniable that there's aspects of consciousness in this phenomena, but it's also undeniable that it has a physical aspect as well. That's what he says. Right, yeah. Which may, you know, there's any number of interpretations of that as well. Like, it doesn't imply that, it doesn't necessarily imply that, like, nuts and bolts physical aliens have mastered some kind of consciousness technology. Yes. It That could be an answer, but it could also be that the consciousness entities from the other realm have mastered uh, the ability to manifest physical objects in ours. Yeah, that's more simple. Yeah. To me, than than having a having it the other way around, having yeah. a physical uh, civilization traverse the spirit realm to get here, right? To 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 yeah. m- mess with us, yeah. And it's yeah. I guess I guess the the connection to all of the ancient texts and the visions that people had and sightings and all of that. And lumping all of that into an alien race, I mean, that's just classic ancient aliens. I mean, that's, yeah. you know. So one scenario that's possible that I I kind of thought was what Marty was sort of getting at when we went through this stuff was that there is a spirit realm and stuff we would call supernatural. <clears throat> and that stuff's real. And it's possible to access that spirit realm by you know, the, the classic, you know, meditation, psychedelics, if you want, but basically it's an inner, like you said, it's an inner focus, right? But because that's true, that there are like physical, but highly advanced aliens that have possibly come here and are using that fact, the fact that that stuff is true to trick people into doing these really complicated rituals to gain power. Yeah. 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 Right. So that kind of fits with what you're saying. That, okay. But again, that goes to the, that basically goes, you know, we're just saying ancient aliens at that point. Yeah. Except that we're saying, well, there's, there is a spirit realm and there are, are supernatural slash like spirit realm entities and they do interact with us, but it's always an inner focus. You know, you, you access that not by, because you're trying to like gain power over the outside world, but because you're trying to master yourself and all that kind of stuff. But it would be easy for somebody, some advanced alien race pulling the God gambit. To twist that fact into like, oh, yes, perform this complex ritual with all of these signs and symbols and yeah, yeah, weird yeah. things and you will gain access to power. Right. And they're but, but then then you have to ask yourself, well, why are they doing that? Like, well, what yeah. is the point? You know, because if they're not spiritual beings, they're not harvesting souls. What exactly is it they're trying to do? Or maybe they are trying to harvest our souls so they can pay off the spirit realm. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's like they owe them a bunch of Bitcoin. <laughs> I have no idea. Hmm. But if you think, you know, like one of the things Another, you can say is like if souls really are some kind of strange, valuable currency in the spirit realm and dark entities wish to get them and dark entities can give you power if you can give them souls. Maybe there are aliens here harvesting our souls to pay the dark entities. Crappy farmers. Yeah. That's all I, gotta say. <laughs> Shitty farmer. <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I know. <laughs> just. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I went back through the, both of the episodes and I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I haven't done near the amount of, of research that you and Marty have done on, on this topic, but I just, you know, that's why maybe I'm just being a scurp tart. I don't know. I just don't, uh, I don't think that there's, I, it, it seems overcomplicated and oversimplified at the same time. Yeah. Well, simplify one aspect and then and then complicate the other one to make it work. I just Yeah. I I it seems to me like the trickster element is present in in a lot of this stuff. It's I think Marty was arguing that there are multiple factions involved here and at least two of them aren't human. I mean, I I saw him say that in the Discord recently. Um, and that's because he thinks that there is a good and evil, not, I mean, maybe those are the wrong terms. There, there's a, there's a faction that is not bad. And then there's a faction that doesn't really care 
or whatever is like I don't know if you could say it's evil, you know, but it isn't good, right? <clears throat> it isn't here to help us. It's there for its own purposes or whatever. <clears throat> I don't even know if I can say that that's true. Like, is there a good and evil in this realm? You know, it, it's... How can we even know what their motives are? You know, if if you can... If you exist in the spirit realm and you can kind of see everything, maybe maybe you can clearly see that what really needs to happen is just erase the human race, and that would be better for everybody involved in the entire universe, including the spirit realm. Bring all those spirits back to the spirit realm and do something else. <laughs> you know and the experience and they're and they're fighting against the ones that want to keep us here and those ones are the ones that are bad the ones that don't want us all to die it's I, what i mean is is that it's impossible to know what their motives are yes so i'm not saying i believe that i'm just saying how do you tell what's good and what's bad in a realm you can barely comprehend right you know with entities that you can barely comprehend and people are like, well, you can ask them and they tell you that they're good. No, yeah, yeah, just yeah. come on. Like if we if we acknowledge the fact that the trickster is there, you know, you can just feel it. Right. Well, I I refuse to believe that I can just intuitively understand whether something is good or evil because, you know, you got a fear response. Somebody shows up and it's incredibly powerful and you're just terrified of it. It doesn't mean it's bad. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just don't I just don't think that, you know, may, maybe it is true that humans can fully discern. When the entity shows up, whether it's a good or evil spirit, but I would say I would want to keep in mind that it's that they're probably able to trick you. Yeah, and that's that's more likely to me than that they're they're completely incapable of tricking you into thinking that they're good when they're not. Yeah, it's like um, you know, you run into a friendly bear. In the woods. You know, yeah. You give him a snack and he's like all friendly. You can pet him and stuff. Yeah. So you're like, oh yeah, he's friendly. No. That's not necessarily what that means. You're not, you may not be aware what that bear is capable of. Right. Yeah. In the future. Doesn't mean that just because he's not killing you right now that it won't happen in five minutes. <laughs> that's, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Watcher's putting a whole bunch of stuff up there. Yeah. Yep. Soul mining. Yep. <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I agree that it, it, it seems to complicate the whole issue. If you, you know, like, can't we just talk about UFOs and, you know, no, we can't because they merge. There, there's this overlap. The overlap may be on purpose to muddy the waters. You know, that was what I was trying to bring up with that, 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 the aspects of consciousness that the UFO phenomena seems to show are really advanced tech imitating what we would otherwise term as spiritual or supernatural events. Yeah. That they're imitating it, and they're doing that on purpose because they're, if they're trying to muddy the waters. I don't know. Or possibly the spirit realm is the one doing the overlap on purpose and muddying the waters with the whole UFO phenomena. Yeah. And it's, you know, for me... The, the very beginning of the series was the most impactful because it's amazing to see what, how much how much resources the government has has spent on looking into this yeah. in sort of a very secretive way. Yeah. Now is that a psyop? Yeah, let's spend billions of dollars over the next couple of decades or whatever just really digging into this and telling everybody that we're not that yeah. we're totally not <laughs> yeah is that is that to trick other intelligence agencies right is this another like yeah let's let's start wrapping our potatoes in tin foil and spinning them on the television right and acting like we're getting better reception yeah because we know other people are spying on us yeah that could be it it's you know but still Regardless of, of what their intentions were, it's that's really interesting that all of that took takes place. Um, and I don't know what to make of it, but it's this stuff, you know, the accounts. I've always had issues with this type of stuff because, you know, even with the with the missing four hundred one, it's very similar. Yeah, you've got these accounts that are incomplete, or it's just totally anecdotal and and a lot of it does 
incorporate like this spiritual experience that people had. But I mean, how do you explain those things? I, I don't. Yeah. Did they have a spiritual experience because whatever they saw blew their mind? Right. You know, I, I don't Does know. That, is that what turns it spiritual? Like the spiritual aspect is that it, it's paradigm shattering or something. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. And that's that's that happens a lot. Yeah. With things that are not UFO related. You know, people have spiritual experiences because they have some totally mind blowing experience that doesn't have anything to do with UFOs. Yeah. There is no spoon. And that's the answer. And perhaps that's why, you know, that that could be one reason why uh, hallucinogens ha- cause spiritual experiences because it's so otherworldly. It's it just yeah. takes you out of your reality and it gives, pe- you know, it's like that may just be the what it what causes the spiritual experience to begin with. I don't know. Yeah. And then so then again, the question you're, we would ask is like, well, what does it even mean to have a spiritual experience? What, what are we even talking about? You know, what is exactly. the, what is the this, definition of this a spiritual? This is very hard to pin down, which is why the accounts yeah. and trying to use the accounts and you have to take them at face value in order to try to use them as yeah. a data set. Right. Yeah. But I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was going on in the, in, in the last couple of episodes that I'm just like, man, this is so you know, conversations between people or somebody channeling something and here's what they said. And it's, yeah. you know, trying to draw connections with all that stuff is just, it's like, yeah, you can follow it, but what does it really mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, wary of channeling in, of all types. Soraya, you know, says that the only channeling that he's ever looked at that he thought was possibly worth something is, is the Seth material. But it's just like even if you take at face value that channeling is what it says it is, which is the, some other spirit communicating through you by either using your vocal cords in your mouth to talk or the automatic writing to use your hand to write. Well, you don't know what that entity is or what its goals are. Like I always fall back on that. You don't know what you're getting, you know. And that's again. Yeah, that, and, and so this I have to say this again. <clears throat> I'm I'm trying to reiterate it because you, like the Ouija board or the channeling or whatever, you know, you got all these people and you're moving the thing around and it spells something. Are you dealing with an alien race who's discovered technology that gives them access to the spirit realm to then talk to the people using the Ouija board or through <laughs> the channeling person? <laughs> right. Because if that realm really exists, then how did these aliens have, I mean, who did they run into when they got there? Yeah. Maybe it was empty. But I mean, and they are all the entities the, we think exist there. But it's like it assumed in that model is that our consciousnesses are all from there. Yeah. To begin with. Right. So there, so there has to be something there. Mm-hmm. Right. That consciousness is non-local. I mean, the consciousnesses that were there had to decide to come here in the first place. Right. Yeah. So there must be some there that didn't. Right. It's yeah. just, I, I, it's so speculative, but the point is. It's it's even it's a bigger stretch to then go further and say, well, it was somebody else who just got access to it yeah. by technology, and that's almost a you know that's well, I mean it's I don't know it just it, it's just <laughs> it's an overcomplication to me. Yeah, and I mean you can even take it to the simulation hypothesis, right? That the spirit realm is really just outside the simulation. There you go. Yeah. You know, and yes, our consciousnesses are non-local because they're actually from the real world. And yes, there are a whole bunch of entities there, and possibly all this "quote unquote" supernatural stuff that we experience here is a product of the fact that we're not in the real world, and the real world is making changes to the code or possibly yeah. making supernatural-looking stuff happen on purpose to make the game fun or weird. I don't know. But yeah, in that scenario, the simulation scenario, yeah, we all chose to came here, come here because we're all players, you know, at least, I mean, those of us who aren't NPCs are all players, you know, there may be in the simulation hypothesis, there may be a lot of NPCs. You just don't know which one, which person's a player and which one isn't. 
Yeah. And the, the nature of the game seems to be that, you know, if it is a game, I know not all simulation hypotheses postulate that the universe is like a game that everybody's playing, but that is an easy analogy. So the nature of the game is that you don't know which ones are NPCs and which ones are players. And the simulation is really good at making NPCs that act a lot like players, you know. And so you yeah. feel like you're in a populated world, even though there might not be that many players. But if the, if the whole universe is a simulation, is it just here to simulate life on Earth? Or is it actually simulating the entire universe and some players are very, very advanced aliens? You know, do you get to, if you do you like graduate from the from the human version and you get to play a Cepha with lots of technology and you can come here and mess with humans? You know, you can take these you can take these analogies endlessly yeah. and ask tons of questions. Yeah. But the point is that it's interesting how many of these ideas you can see how well that if you set it up a certain way, it can look like what what humanity has been calling the spirit realm and the gods and all that kind of stuff for a long time. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's just stacks of assumptions. That's that's really yeah, what it comes yeah, down to. Right. So the point to me seems to be to just investigate the phenomena as best you can. It, it Something is happening. It's like the 411 stuff. I don't know what's happening. But I like to investigate it. It's mysterious. It's strange. Yes, it's difficult because you're not boot, you can't be boots on the ground for the disappearances. You can't be boots on the ground for the experiences for the UFO stuff unless you're seeing it yourself. And then you're just you just have another anecdote. And then since you're inside of it, it's probably a lot more difficult to investigate properly, at least, you know, using the uh, the dispassionate empirical scientific method. You know, when you're involved in the paradigm shattering traumatic traumatic event, it's difficult for you being the person inside of it to investigate it in an objection, you know, objective way. Yeah. So having the experience isn't necessarily the best way to investigate the phenomena. Right. And I, you know, I have had discussions with people, people who are experiencers, you know, have said, well, you know, no, because then you, you can get direct information. I'm like, yes, but, but standing outside of the phenomena itself, I say, well, how do you know you're not being tricked? And, and it, it, when you're in the experience, I would say that if you are dealing with some extremely advanced race or some very powerful spiritual entity, you don't have any way of knowing you're not being tricked. And so taking everything it says at face value is it might be the right way to go, but it might not. And you have no way of knowing which one of those is true, is the right yeah. one. So it's 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 difficult. You know, is it better to investigate the phenomena from outside of it? That also may not be it. it, it I don't I don't know. And we're up on another break here. But, yeah, this this conversation. And the, is, and the other option, you know, is that this is it's totally materialistic, right? Nick, the biological robot, would tell us, yeah, like, no, there's no spirit realm. There's no spirit realm. Okay, yeah, so yeah. going with that idea, then we're just talking about ancient aliens. Yeah, I mean that's right. We're talking about technology indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, yeah. And so demons and all that kind of stuff. None of that's real, yeah. which would mean that the these occult practices is all BS too. Right. And it's just, you know, yeah. So it's it's, but even that. We'll get to it in the in the in the last segment, but th it's possible that the occult practices can still be a product of a totally mechanistic view of the universe All and right. technology. Well, if they worked, then uh... <laughs> some of them might work. Okay. <laughs> And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, brothers of the Serpent Podcast, the final segment of the deconstruction of Marty's UFO entire <laughs> six episode complex. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So I think I've mentioned this briefly on the show before, but there was a book I read. Uh, I think it's called Skinwalkers. And if this is the right book, it's by Tony Hillerman. It's called a mobile for a reason. What's that? Your phone. Yeah. You don't have to leave it way over there away from your mic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> hold on. Let me take a look, guys. Uh, 
<laughs> Looks like you can get it for three fifty nine. Uh, yeah, so it's called Skinwalkers uh, by Tony Hillerman, and it was, um, I thought it was really entertaining. It's a kind of a mystery with a little bit, like toss in a little bit of horror because we're dealing with Skinwalker stuff yeah. here. But the basic premise is, and this is, as far as I know, this is one of a set where he's basically, the main character is a detective on a reservation, a Navajo reservation mm -hmm. but <clears throat> uh, without giving away too many spoilers the book is eventually postulates the the prospect that the uh sand paintings that are made by uh navajo medicine men slash shaman whatever that they that, that they have these patterns that they draw with and they you know they spend all this time going out into the desert and getting different colored sands you know and then they have these secret patterns and they're highly secret and they pass them down student master to student master to student you know and they'll build there there's they have a hut uh, like a, a building in which the paintings are made and they're obviously they're made on the floor cuz you're you're you've got all these sands and you're drawing with them and there are patterns for various different effects you want to, to make. And then once you've gotten the effect, you erase the pattern and don't let anybody see it because it's very secret and powerful uh, magic, right? The book postulates that the sand patterns are actually allowing access to an ancient alien tool that was left here a long time ago, which is basically of artificial intelligence that exists in some kind of quantum realm. Like, you can't see it. But he, he makes the... I think if I'm remembering pro correctly... It's been years and years since I read this book, but if I'm rem remembering correctly, he gives this analogy of, like, imagine you're an ant on the freeway and you come across a crowbar. Right. How would you... You would have no idea... Of figuring out what that crowbar is for but it's because some human was driving along and stopped because they had a flat tire and they got out their crowbar and a bunch of other tools and then they forgot the crowbar and they left it there and then they took off right and there's the crowbar and the ant is encountering this gigantic impossibly to impossible to understand thing and it's affecting his world so that's the idea that he he says and that, that the sand paintings are these navajo magicians figuring out certain ways to access powers of this technological device that was left here a long time ago and is like a forgotten tool, basically. So in that way, you can have, you, he kind of combines this like, well, look at this really complex geometric ritual where they're, you know, they're doing it with sand, but the idea of like drawing a really complicated diagram on the floor or whatever. In this book, he's saying, well, here's a way where you can still make it the ancient aliens theory that drawing this giant, this, this really complex diagram is a way to a get access to this strange technological it's, tool. So is that access in their minds or something or i mean how does that work or is the access in the sand the the as far as i remember the sand is a, like a way to is a way to get access to it to like in other words it recognizes the pattern you know and then and certain the, things will take place it's like giving it a command yeah like a computer command or something yeah exactly so, and in the book, it's cool because he talks about how the Navajos sell sand paintings, very beautiful ones, but they, but the people who make them always put errors in them, so they're not really doing the magic with the paintings that are being sold, because the real paintings with the correct geometric designs are dangerous. Hmm. So it's it's a sci-fi book or or a, a mystery novel, uh, you know, it's it's fiction. But the point is, is like he's he has postulated a way to merge these two concepts which is what i which is what i'm saying so it's possible to have it where drawing these weird diagrams on the floor are really complex diagrams and lighting the right number of candles or whatever may be the way to it was just it depends on who built the tool and how they would access it and how they interacted with it what what is the interface you know so he's implying that the interface is uh is also beyond our comprehension but we can we can emulate some method of interfacing with the machine by by doing complex geometric paintings with different colors. 
In other words, that whatever race, whatever ancient, whatever ancient alien built this tool, their bio- biology and the way that they interact with the universe is very different from ours too. So instead of speaking, they show colors like a squid or something, you know, so if you do the right painting on the ground, the computer recognizes it as a, as a, yeah. as a command. Yeah. So it's a materialist yes. uh, command. It's not. It's not giving them some kind of spiritual access. Right, but like it's that. mistaken for magic is what I'm trying to say, right? That, you know, that, that that's that's what he's saying in the book, that like, yes, it actually works, but it isn't magic. You can explain it, not fully, because we don't understand the technology, but basically the idea is, is there is tech behind this. It isn't anything supernatural. And yet for thousands of years, it's been considered to be magical practice. And what what you're doing, drawing this stuff on the ground with sand, is causing magic to take place. It's yeah, just the, the watcher's mechanism. buying it. He's saying it's sand is silica. It's basically shattered crystal and unassembled microchips. So <laughs> That's right. He's totally buying it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying it's it's it is a way to merge the two problems, right? That that maybe those geometric f- things and very complicated rituals and and the sounds you make by chanting, whatever, maybe all those things combined together are accessing some kind of technology. I don't know. Yeah. And and probably some uh, or lot even lots of what they're doing in the ritual isn't necessary, right? Like yeah, you can Im- you can imagine like if if you're typing in com- commands into a computer, if the computer was able to ignore a bunch of bad input but see the command that's in there, it can enact its the the command while just discarding all the the bad input. Yeah. If it's a good AI. Or the computer's not worried about your posture while you're typing the... Uh, right, exactly. But the ritual may mean, like, you got to sit up very straight. That's right. And, uh, that's right. You, hold and your you need to wear to this sew. particular garment. But you don't. You just need to get yeah. the command right. <laughs> it looks like a suit and tie. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you got to put yourself in a small cube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you need this stapler on your desk. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just... <laughs> so there's so many aspects to the ritual that are completely unnecessary, but yet passed on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, you know me, I went down the whole Solomonic, you know, magic yeah, rabbit tell hole. Tell me there. your name, demon. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> the Tetragrammaton and the... Uh, the what is it Solomon the key of Solomon yeah. all that kind of stuff the greater and, and lesser and at keys. the time when I was when I was reading those I was thinking of astronomy I'm like okay you know they're they're passing on some kind of you know uh, magic or whatever but it it has to do with the positions of the planets and everything it has to happen on certain days and you know it's 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 very classic um like witchcraft right Mm -hmm. like you got to have some leg of a frog or something like that i mean i'm just making this up but it's something like that (laughs) and then you have to go don't don't tell them the real you have to go bury it in the you know in a place in a specific place under a certain sky you know it has to be the right time waxing gibbous (laughs) yeah and and none of it works right you know i'm sure people have tried all this stuff it doesn't work and my thought was like, well, the reason it doesn't work is because, uh, you know, they hadn't, they, they, they had forgotten, or at least um, when they were working on it, they didn't have all the planets. Yeah. They yeah, only so had like, the ones I, that were visible. Well, these planets are in the right order, but there's a, there's, there's four other ones that, are that not you can't the... see. Yeah. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not totally opposed to this I, I will entertain the possibility that these things could work somehow I don't see how but yeah it doesn't really matter I don't yeah I don't I don't know how quantum freaking mechanics works either <laughs> yeah but I'm accepting that it's a thing and people are figuring it out I don't know yeah uh, but yeah that it just the other aspect of it for me is is probably could be shot down pretty easily by a number of arguments, but I'm just like, where, if these things really worked, you know, these, these occult practices and people summoning, uh, supernatural powers that whatever, like where are, how come this hasn't become widely used in the open? Just like other things that actually work. Yeah. 
Like when, you know, if electricity is a real thing, even though it seems supernatural or whatever it may have seemed like when, when Nikola Tesla and other people were building I mean, you know, you t- yeah, give me the finest copper you have and let me yeah. wrap it around this magnet. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. people are just like, what the hell are you doing, right? This <laughs> this could look like some kind of occult practice, but it yeah. actually works. Yeah. And it actually drives a motor or something, you know, and it, it, it you can distribute the, uh, the energy and you can, you can build different things that transduce it into motion and light and all, all types of stuff. And it works. Yeah. And it, be, it is so obvious that it works that it became widely used on the entire planet. Yeah. But the electricity doesn't tell you, if you tell people how to use me, I will stop working for you also. Then why are there books? Yeah. The grimoires are always a little bit wrong. I just, yeah, that's... I, I'm not saying this is true. I'm just telling you, like this is this is the answer to some of that that I've heard. You know, no, yes. no magical grimoire is all is ever fully explanatory. That's what I'm saying. It can be. There's a there's a any number of arguments that you can make against. Yeah. It. My my argument is simply that, like, well, out of all the thousands of years, where's the one guy who decided I'll just like write it down perfectly and let everybody try it. And that's possible. And like, if that does happen, what happens to the text? You know, does it get destroyed? Like, is it too powerful? I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, you're saying, and, and I'm looking at like, okay, you're saying like, why isn't this more widespread? I think you want to look. Widespread. If you want to look at these people, like, like the guy who went d- that was doing the Babylon working and all that kind of stuff. You know, okay, Parsons and Crowley, and yeah. Well, did it work? I don't know. You know, are they just hiding the fact that it worked or what, you know, why why was why were they writing it down and why is it something that you can find on the internet? Yeah. Or in books. It but if it worked, it's like it's it and because it was written down and there's, you know, it's like okay, well then where's the antichrist or <laughs> I don't know. I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh I'm just really skeptical. I'm just like, these guys are, are I want to call them names that I don't want to say on the podcast. <laughs> you know, you're, if you are that power hungry that you're willing to summon a demon. Yeah. Then you're just an asshole. Right. And because you're an asshole, you are going to rise in certain institutions like governments. Yeah. Not to get too political here. Yeah. Bureaucracies, yeah, and you're gonna get more money, and you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna do all this stuff, and then, and then certain some types of people, you know, maybe they're really good at being an asshole, but they're not very good at rising to the top of the food chain in in these institutions, and you end up being Charles Manson. You know, you're just is it the occult practices that make them that way, or is it just who they are that makes them willing to go try to do these things? Yeah that are just incredibly messed up. Why would you want to do that? Right? You have to be a certain type of psychopath. Yeah. And, and that we're, we're is s- enough explanation to me for the rest of the stuff that they do in their life. Yeah. And worst case scenario is that it's it's that both it's it's their but the fact that they're assholes and willing to do that kind of stuff and that the stuff that they're willing to do actually works. That's the worst case scenario. Right? Yeah, and people, you know, Not like Hitler, they, yeah. change history and 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 change the world in so many ways we'll never even fully understand. Yeah. And and that's that's my point. It's yes, you're right. The worst case scenario is that it is it it does work and the, you know, that is why they were able to do the things that they did. Well, not even that. Like I think that I think that all of them that, that a lot of these people that end up doing these kinds of things, they don't come to a good end. You know, they don't have happy lives and they don't have a good end. Right. And that's like, and people are like, well, that's the price you pay for calling upon the powers of demons, right? <laughs> but right. is it is it really that or is it just because we can't really comprehend the, the motivation? Again, we can't comprehend the motivations of these spirits, and I think whatever some- they are. And the, they respond to this guy, but not that guy, both doing the same exact ritual because the spirit itself has, you know, it, it can choose, right? It, it, like... 
to me, the hardest thing to believe is that some kind of specific summoning ritual forces this all powerful entity to do what you want. That's the yeah, part yeah, I have yeah. the hardest yeah. time believing that there is like that somebody has discovered rules where like I can bind this thing to my will, right? That that's the part where yeah. I'm just like, no. The demon code prevents me <laughs> right. from there's... declining a rock of challenge. <laughs> there's some kind of demon code. <laughs> Somebody exactly in the Discord right. pointed out that like it could be something as simple as that guy cut in front of you in or and cut in front of the person in line that day and made him a little bit late. Yeah. For the person who ran the red light and would have killed them. Yeah. Right. And, like There's that like, guy was Hitler who yeah. would have been killed in a car crash when he was young or whatever, but because somebody cut him in front of him in line, it's like, you know, yes, that's sort of the butterfly effect. Right. Yeah, you can right. take this tiny it's yeah, so yeah, there are, are innumerable events that if they happened a little bit differently, all of history would be changed for certain individuals, right? It's it, yes, I agree. And that's that's see that's the thing that makes biology so interesting. Because when you look at even the smallest biological organism that's it's doing stuff. Yeah. Right? And it's like, why is it doing that? Why did it turn left right then? Yeah. Whereas when you're dealing with strictly inanimate objects, those things are discoverable. You, yeah. you cannot necessarily discover why the, the little tiny microscopic organism that has some mode of propulsion decided to turn left. I mean, there's, we don't have a yeah. way to make sense out of that in every case. Yeah. Obviously, Sometimes in some can. cases, yeah, well, it hit, a, it hit a, another object. Yeah. But or it was hot on this side and cooler over there. Yeah, so you could you could maybe take a petri dish or something of, with with these little these little organisms swimming around, and you could study them and say record all of their actions, and then you could start building this gigantic conspiracy theory <laughs> by connecting certain motions of certain beings to other ones to end up like okay, the last one alive. It was because he teamed up with that one <laughs> to cut this guy off when they were going for that piece of food, <laughs> right? You could, be, but yeah, is that really what's going on? Yeah, it's very hard to to say. Well, I you know to. You're the guy with the with the with the giant cork board on the wall with all the strings. <laughs> with all drawn, the strings, you know, yeah. these things don't really they happen in physics, but it's it's very discoverable. If that's it, you know, you can build that theory and then you can test it. Yeah, because it's all the same physics. Whether you're, you know, whether it's now or it already happened, well, we can make it happen again because we know the circumstances. Yeah, but you can't make it happen again with an organism. And so we're very complex organisms. And it's just, yeah, it's like, at a certain point, drawing the connections between the actions of these organisms to div discover some gigantic scheme is, is, I don't know. I just... Yep. It's, it's... <laughs> You're resisting the giant conspiracy. I this am. Is, this is the thing we've had since the beginning of the show. <laughs> no. I refuse to believe that there's a giant conspiracy. <laughs> I believe that there's a myriad of tiny conspiracies. <laughs> Relatively yeah. speaking, they're yeah. all tiny. Yeah. And some of them, you know, are much bigger than others. But I, so, I just, would you rather go with the 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 idea like this stuff has been happening for a long time? Uh, so there's no long game there. It's just it's some kind of maybe it's a natural phenomena that will eventually be discoverable. Are we talking about what are we in specifics? Just the the UFO like, phenomena, yeah, in UFO slash whatever, any of the kind of stuff that merges. Like you know, it kind of weirdly merges together with a bunch of other stuff, but like. Do we think that this is all the same phenomena or is it maybe just a set of natural phenomena? You know, and that like like in other words, is there a way we could look at the all these cases going back thousands of years and say just like an astronomer does, these things are really happening because there's too many reports, but 
it's probably some kind of natural phenomena or several sets of natural phenomena, and eventually we'll be able to explain it using that. I mean, that is a possible answer, I think. It's one of those things like the 411 stuff. I, I hesitate to even draw conclusions or even dive into the rabbit hole because of the absence of, of reliable information. Yeah. It's like there's reliable yeah, there's, in what way? There's a lot. Well, the, because there's so much anecdotal information. Yeah. That makes up the vast majority. And so it's like, yes, we could take, we can, we can trust the certain researchers, right? That have done really good work and they seem to be very good scientists and they've, they've gone in and they've weeded out a lot of these stories. They've done tons of research. They've gone all over the world talking to people and interviewing and, and say, okay, let's not, let's not put this case in the book. Yeah. You know, they've done all this work and they say, okay, these are the most robust cases. Yeah. That, that I have found. And maybe there's a number of those researchers that have done that. And so then you can go, like Marty has done, and you can dive into all those that sort of seem to be trusted sources that had trusted sources that had yeah. trusted sources. It's still anecdotal for the most part. And it's just hard to, to really try to put all that together and then draw conclusions for me. It's the yeah. same thing with the 411. I'm not going to say it's not happening. Right. I'm not going to say it's Bigfoot or it's some alien yeah. or interdimensional being snatching people out of reality. I just don't know. I, I'm still, I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's really strange that the government has spent so much money looking into this. It is also strange that we've picked up weird blips on, on the FLIR and the yeah. other imaging, you know, uh, Radar equipment, and stuff, radar, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I've seen stuff in the sky, yeah, that doesn't match anything that I'm I'm aware of. Uh, there are accounts, there are historical accounts of people seeing stuff coming out of the ocean and all that. You know, I'm I'm totally fine with with all that. I just don't know if I'm ready to start to draw a conclusion. I w I was all in on the ancient aliens for a while, yeah. but then I became I started leaning more towards like. Ancient high civilization. Ancient humans, yeah. Ancient high civilization, yeah. And not even humans necessarily. I mean, there right. could be... Hominids. Uh, terrestrial beings, whatever you... Yeah. Are, you know, I don't know. But it's just none of it's concrete. And I don't, I'm not accusing anybody of being concrete. I don't think Marty is trying to present some concrete um, hypothesis either. Yeah. You think that you're just saying you think that some of his strings on the cork board are too long. Yeah, I'm just like, all right, bro, you, got <laughs> <laughs> you need to get rid of some of that string, buddy. I don't know if you can actually connect those with that red string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the, I guess it really just hit me when it came to the, like all the accounts of the, the connection to the occult practices and all that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know. It's, it's just, um, to answer your question about, do I think it's discoverable? I, I think that, I, I guess it's, if I were going to, if I had to pick a pet theory, the easier thing for me to pick would be there's a spirit realm and then there's also aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we right. both may have connections to the spirit realm if that's where consciousness comes from and maybe there that things like um telepathy and are possible. Yeah. And so that that may play a part. Yep. I agree. I I tend towards the like there is a spirit realm and there's also material universe aliens. Yeah. And are they running us? I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not, not clear. Ready to go either. that far. Right. Mm -hmm. it, and can we explain all of the seemingly supernatural encounters in the ancient world, according to the texts as being connected to this? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of them were, I don't, you know. Yeah. In some cases, the visions do look 
Well, I guess you were pointing out the other night when we were talking about this that on the one hand, the visions do, you know, you can view them with a modern lens and say, well, that could be done with technology. But on the other hand, it can also be done with psychedelics. Yeah, you. psychedelics seems like a very big possibility. So it was, uh, you know, old Ezekiel was like, on psychedelics. Yeah. Saw How many stuff? guys yeah. go out in the desert and have visions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Johnson. Johnson tried to and there's about even, his UFO and, experience in the desert. <laughs> still, right. I still haven't heard it. <laughs> and there's even <laughs> traditions of uh, of people going into caves and fasting, like just going yeah. into the depths of a cave in the pitch black and just laying down for yeah. days. Yeah. And you have a spiritual experience right yeah. you have visions you're you're starving yourself this is that that kind of stuff is well known yeah. that you will actually hallucinate in certain sensory deprivation uh, situations along with starvation or fasting and then the next you know i would also bring up just to be devil's advocate here is hallucinate a loaded term it might be yeah are these? This are you a, actually like accessing a, the uh, an actual other dimension? Right. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm not ready to. <laughs> I feel like that. I feel like in a lot of in, well, I can't say a lot, but I feel like it is a loaded term. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we talked about this too. Entoptic. Yes, visions. the entoptic patterns that show up in it. Oh yes, it's just it's like it's they exist. They exist in the patterns of your retina or something. You know, it's like these, these are all mechanistic, materialistic I'm, I'm explanations. Not, I don't buy that either. Yeah. Um, is it worth looking into scientifically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was the other thing I was going to say about the... Um, and it's possible, you know, if you want to really take it, you say, well, yeah, those patterns are there in your eyeball because they're because our bodies are built off the geometric principles that come from the spirit realm, right? Yeah. It's like yeah. <laughs> you can, you can t turn it right back around, yeah. A lot of those patterns, though, are emergent. Like like yeah. phi, yeah, you know, or phi or whatever. Yep, that's emergent. Yeah, on it's not built into the DNA of plants and stuff. Right. It's because it's physics. It's yeah. because it's the it's the next best place to put something for the light to get to it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's the path of least resistance. Yeah, it's solving a complex problem. If in you're a in a very interesting and simple way in the yeah end. yeah it's just it's just difficult to discover but it is a complex problem like this like where do you in a in three-dimensional space where do you put the next leaf you know or how do you arrange all the leaves so that they get the most amount of light possible when the light is basically yeah. coming from above yeah and and when that you know when you when you add sensors to an organism like the plant is able to sense like it has ways of sensing the amount of light hitting it yeah you end up with an emergent yeah geometric pattern that yep. totally has to do with the environment and it's like bees right they use the pattern of for building their hives yeah and that just happens to be the best way to store stuff yeah right? so it's, so it's it the is, strongest structural structure possible yeah so these things are fundamental yeah right so maybe if that's i i, I think those the some of the designs in in the the occult practices you know are based on sacred geometry which sacred geometry is a way of deriving or deri maybe that's not the right word a way of arriving at the fundamental principles of the of the universe itself yeah so it it looks more likely to me that this is again quant stuff yeah. Rather than the potato and you know, this fake thing, the, the geometric designs are, it's like, this is a lost technology. It's like, it's like writing mathematical symbols that you have no clue what they mean because you think it's going to give you the power of a nuclear bomb. Yeah. yeah right. That's a good Long analogy. after you, you've completely lost mathematics. Yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah. But it's like, yes, in the past, this gave you ultimate power over the <laughs> fundamental nature of the universe, right? right. The atom. <laughs> and so they're over there, like, scribbling stuff into this. It's got to be just right. And yeah. even if they got it exactly right, it was a mathematical equation. Yeah. For somebody to do something in the physical realm. Yeah. And they're just they, writing it down, thinking yeah, it's going to give them the power. They're writing, yes, they're writing down the mathematics, but they'd have no way to apply. Yeah. 
the yeah. And so you can see that there's like embedded in there is this deep knowledge. Yeah. Of the universe. It's like it's so yeah. So that's that's just what it seems like to me. And I'm just that that was kind of my main um riff today was about the about the occult practices stuff, looking to be some and, but if those geometric principles of the material universe are emergent from some aspects of the spiritual realm, then it is possible that drawing those shapes may summon demons I, or whatever you want to call them. I just would take <laughs> it back to that. I, know, you know? I was just saying, yeah, <laughs> I see where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hey, it's all good. It's in the future. <laughs> <laughs> whole butt flapper is going to be writing E equals MC squared in the sand. <laughs> right. Just being like, hey, yeah, hey this uh, will help us defeat our enemies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to wrap it up here. I think we're done. Sadly, That's it. Sands yes. of time yeah. have run out. Well, I got a couple things to say before we get to the complete end of the show. Number one. Uh, Kyle and I will be going as hosts with Ben from Uncharted X on his Egypt tour this year in October. And Ben told me that there is maybe possibly a spot or two open. So if somebody is interested and you guys can make your travel plans in this much of a rush, uh, go to unchartedx.com to get details about that and maybe just send Ben a, send Ben an email or something like that and see if there still is a spot open. But yeah, I told him I'd mention it on the show. That'd be great if we had some Snake Force to go with us. And I uh, also want to mention, you got you got uh, PayPal donor, donors at all? Oh, let me check uh, I got I got a couple things here from the Patreon. I want to mention, um, let's see, you got the Commander? There it is, the Commander. Yeah, it's all Josh Parchman, Snake Force Commander. Thank you so much. And also uh, Roland... Roland Belstead is also a Snake Force commander, and Justin Dickinson is Snake Force commander. Wow. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Crycheck. I think we mentioned him already. He's a master Snake Force captain, and Eric is also a Snake Force commander. And then we have uh, Frank, Frank M, and Zachariah Baker, and Peter Shell who are Ascended Snake Force Masters. Ascended Snake Force Master. So thank you guys so much. There's our, we finally got a jingle for old <laughs> Ascended Snake Force Master. Let's hear that again. <laughs> Ascended Snake Force Master. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for supporting the show. Hope you're enjoying the Patreon content. And yes, we do have a Patreon and we have Patreon content, so if you're interested, you can join the Patreon for as little as $1.08 a month. Um, so if you are interested in hearing the Patreon content, we don't have any, you know, even for that low amount, you can you can hear all the Patreon content we publish. And I imagine we'll publish some Patreon stuff uh, while we're gone in the Scablands, and also some stuff will come out while we're in Egypt, because that's going to be a two-week trip. Uh, but yeah, what do you got? What do you got over there from PayPal? So I got a I got a donation from Ed Nightingale. Hey, oh Ed. Hey, buddy. He says, "Hey, Russ and Kyle, wanted to send you a few bucks and in appreciation for what you do." But why? Oh, yeah, it was one one hundred and forty four dollars. So he huh. says, "Why fund one forty four? You ask? <laughs> Hope to have the opportunity to explain that to you guys soon. Keep up the good work, Ed. Ah, oh, thanks, Ed. So thank you, Ed. Yes. And uh, in fact, I have been thinking about you recently too, buddy, and uh, we'd love to have you back on the show sometime. Yeah. So um, appreciate that. And uh, also, Kevin. Kevin Williams. All right. He says, snakes, I made it to sow 200 uh, and 201. <laughs> So did you. Very well done. <laughs> he says, I did send $99 at sewed 100, and in four to five months when Kyle gets around to reading this, Russ can eat crow. <laughs> Love you guys and the whole snake fam. Do you even snake, bro? <laughs> oh, because I was like, is he going to send us another 100 bucks when he gets to 200? I guess I'll eat some He crow sent then. us another 100 bucks. All right. Thank you, man. Thank you, buddy. Uh, yeah. Executive producers of this show. Yeah. 
You are the executive producers of whatever show I end up reading your email on. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, and also I see there is a anonymous uh, $49 donation. Oh. For uh, toward travel expenses, so very much appreciated for yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks so much to everybody who's donated. And yeah, we love you. Yep. Warm and fuzzies. All right, guys. Brothers of the Serpent at gmail.com is the email for the podcast. Send us emails there, and they may get read on the show. I do read them all. Can't read them all on the show, but uh, if you email us there, uh, it's possible that it'll get read on the show. Website is brothersoftheserpent.com. Go there for all the podcast-related stuff, including the Patreon. Uh, if you want to join the Pyramid Scheme through the Patreon or the PayPal. Uh, let's see. Library of the Serpent. The links for that are also there. That's run by Jeff. <clears throat> as well as the Discord, which is also run by Jeff. And we got a bunch of great moderators in there. Uh, the Discord is always growing. So if you want to join like-minded snakes to, from around the world to talk about snake-like stuff and exchange snake facts and pictures and all kinds of stuff, then join the Discord. And you can find that on the website. So... I should give a little explanation here because some people have been asking. The Dis Discord is both a mobile app and you can also use it through your web browser. So some people prefer to use it just on their computer. I, I use mine on my phone. I I'll almost never log into the website. I always use it through the app. But you can do it both ways. It's very simple. Uh, the server looks complicated when you get in there because there are a lot of channels, but it's easy to surf through and see what people are talking about. And the, the names are usually self-explanatory. Not always, but if not... There are usually headings that you can read that explains what the channel is for. And uh, yeah, thanks to History Shift, who makes all of our YouTube videos. Thanks to Pod Doodles, who turns some of our podcasts into interesting doodles. You can watch him drawing while listening to the show. And uh, yeah, thanks to Ben from Uncharted X and Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? And all of you listeners out there, we love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. What does it all mean? <laughs> who did it all? It was aliens, guys. I mean, obviously, it was aliens. <laughs> we know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs>